Hey guys, uh, my name is Sarah. I'm one of the interns at Nepean and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about COPD. Um, so what is COPD? It's a chronic and progressive respiratory condition. It's characterized by one, chronic airflow limitation and two, persistent respiratory symptoms. Um, so it's caused by a mixture of chronic bronchitis, so that's the small airway disease, and emphysema, which is parenchymal destruction. It affects about 5% of the population worldwide and it's the fourth leading cause of death. So it's got a huge disease burden globally. So in terms of the very, very basic pathology, um, you see things like chronic inflammation throughout the lungs. There's hyperplasia of the goblet cells and mucus glands. That's why you get people with COPD always having this productive cough, bringing up white phlegm. Um, there's fibrosis and scar tissue formation throughout the lungs as well. And there's also a narrowing and reduction in the number of small airways. So there's a number of processes going on that are just basically um, destroying the lungs ability to function properly. Um, so having a look just again at the, I suppose, anatomy of the lung and breaking it down into its functional components, the asini, um, you can see the alveolar sacs there. That's where the gas exchange occurs. Um, and in the emphysema, like the emphysema part of it is just going to see a destruction of those alveolar sac walls. Um, so things like recoil is affected. You get a higher residual volume. Just gas exchange is completely affected. You also get a narrowing of the small airways um, due to you know that goblet cell hyperplasia, increased mucus. Um, yeah, and you can have things like if you want to get more complicated, um, COPD can be like proximal asinar, uh, pan asinar, paraceptal, um, and all these different types kind of have vaguely different causes. Um, feel free to have a look. <laughs> Up to date has a great section about it. Um, yeah. Okay, on to our case. Mrs. Mary Smith, a seven year old lady who's come to see you at the GP office. So she's always been a little bit short of breath for a couple of years now, um, but she's really noticed that it's getting worse over the last six months. Uh, initially, it was only when going upstairs, uh, but now she's noticing it just when she's walking around the street and doing her normal activities. So it's actually started to limit her in what she can do. She never has any chest pain and she's never short of breath at rest. Um, she does have a productive cough though that's been going on for a couple of months, um, usually worse in the mornings. Just coughing up white sputum, maybe half a teaspoon every morning. Um, and she does notice that it's worse in the winter time. In terms of her past medical history, uh, she's got hypertension, high cholesterol, type two diabetes, and she's had two admissions to hospital in the last year for what she thinks were chest infections um, and she had antibiotics for them. In terms of her medications, she's on perindopril, uh, statin, metformin for her diabetes and she has no allergies. In terms of a social history, she lives at home alone. She's an ex-smoker with a 40 pack year history. Good on her for quitting. Uh, she's a retired teacher and she's quite socially isolated. And again, this is the first time that she's seeing you, the GP, in about a year's time, let's say. She doesn't really attend the GP much. Okay, so when taking a history from someone coming in with shortness of breath, um, so this is kind of focused on COPD um, and what the, I suppose, most important things to ask about are. So smoking history and exposure to other noxious stimuli are very important risk factors to consider. Um, and then the cardinal symptoms. So the, I suppose the, the classic triad of COPD symptoms would be dyspnea, especially exertional. That's usually the earliest symptom that you'll get. Um, a chronic cough and sputum production. Sputum production usually being worse in the mornings, whitish sputum, um, which can change with infections on top of it. Um, and then other symptoms such as wheeze, feeling of chest tightness, weight gain or loss, uh, limitation of regular activities, uh, depression and anxiety, which happens very, very commonly in COPD, and recurrent uh, respiratory infections as well as associated comorbid conditions like constitutional symptoms, um, cardiac failure and cardiovascular symptoms, 
The number of exacerbations or hospitalizations requiring antibiotics is quite important for assessing the severity of their disease um, and therefore the treatment options, as well as a family history. Um, so in COPD caused by alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, um, family history plays quite a large role. And then obviously asking about medications and social history. Um, now, obviously, when someone comes in with shortness of breath, you can't automatically think COPD. You've got to ask, have a bunch of differentials in your head. So, you know, is this cardiac related? Is it cancer? Is it an infective process? Pneumonia, um, PE, TB, things like that. So you're obviously going to be wanting to ask about infective symptoms, travel history, hemoptysis, constitutional symptoms, um, asking them about orthopnea slash PND, um, edema, all these kinds of things that are going to help you figure out whether or not this truly is COPD or something else is going on. Okay, moving on to examination. So first thing you want to do is take vitals. Um, looking particularly at respirate and oxygen saturations. Um, and then moving on to a respiratory exam. So depending on you know what stage or how progressed her disease is, um, you're going to be seeing different things. But I suppose you would be expecting some chest hyperinflation or you could see a barrel-shaped chest. Um, patients can be in respiratory distress, unlikely in this setting at the GP. Uh, but you'd be wanting to look at things like, are they able to speak in full sentences? Are you seeing um, accessory muscle use? Um, pursed lip breathing? Are they cyanotic? Is there nicotine staining on the hands? Um, and do they have clubbing? Clubbing actually points towards a different um, disease process. That was a fun multiple choice that they decided to throw into our final year exams. Um, yeah, looking at things like deviation of the trachea, is there a pneumothorax going on that's responsible for this? Um, are they hypercapnic? So looking for asterixis. And then you're going to want to auscultate the lungs. Um, in COPD, you're going to get decreased breath sounds. You'll hear a global wheeze. You might hear basal crackles, especially if there's an infective process going on as well. And you could hear distant heart sounds, especially if there's hyperinflation of the chest. Um, and then on percussion, you're going to get hyper resonance. Um, and then obviously, as with any patient coming in with shortness of breath, you'll also want to do a full cardiovascular exam. And because lung cancer is going to be one of your differentials, a lymph node examination is particularly important, um, as well as a GIT exam for completeness. Now, you might have come across this concept of blue bloaters versus pink puffers um, in med school, with blue bloaters being more towards the bronchitis, chronic bronchitis side of things, and pink puffers being your typical emphysema patients. Um, normally, patients kind of have a bit of a crossover with both. Um, but yeah, definitely, depending on what pathological process is more dominant, um, you will see patients skew towards one of these phenotypes. Okay, so on examination of your patient, Mary Smith, uh, you find that her respirate is, it's 20, heart rate's fine, blood pressure's fine, temperature's fine, everything's fine. Uh, she is thin though and quite cachectic. She does have nicotine staining with that 40 pack year history does have a hyperinflated chest, decreased breath sounds. Um, all other examinations are normal. Okay, now in terms of investigations, now remembering this is the first time that she's come in, we don't have a diagnosis of COPD as of yet. Um, so we're just taking bloods to investigate this shortness of breath. So we'll be wanting to do a full blood count. You know, is this anemia going on? Um, EUC is checking the renal function, you know, is she acidotic and that's why she's um, short of breath, trying to breathe off carbon dioxide. 
um, CMPs, check out the thyroid, um, LFTs, depending on clinical suspicion. So if you think that you know, she could have liver failure and portal hypertension going on that's leading to fluid overload, um, you could throw that in. Now, it's important to consider alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, especially in those under the age of 45, if they have no smoking history um, or if they have a family history of COPD. Um, WHO actually recommends that all of those diagnosed with COPD should be screened for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Can't say I've ever seen it done, but hey, that's the recommendation. Um, and the basic process of how alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency actually causes COPD is that alpha-1 antitrypsin uh, protects the lungs from proteases like elastase and trypsin. Um, so obviously if you have a deficiency of those, you're going to get kind of a very similar pathological process to what you would in emphysema. You're just going to be getting a destruction of those alveolar walls. Um, spirometry, so that's a, a massive investigation that you're going to be wanting to do for her and it's pretty much going to give you your diagnosis of COPD and you want that pre and post bronchodilator administration um, because that's what's going to tell you whether or not this is COPD which is partially reversible um, or asthma which you should see a pretty great improvement post bronchodilator. Um, also want to be getting a chest x-ray or CT and doing an ECG as well um, just to make sure, well one, to rule out any acute cardiac event causing the shortness of breath but also you do see ECG changes with COPD. Okay so these are her results so all her bloods were normal but in terms of her spirometry the most important thing that we're looking at here is the FEV1 to FVC ratio. Uh, remembering that FEV1, the forced expiratory volume over one second, which is essentially how much air you can blow out really quickly in one second, um, and the forced vital capacity, which is the total volume that you can, I suppose, blow out. Um, so it's like the total lung capacity minus the residual volume, which is left when you expire. Um, yeah, so her ratio is 0 0.67. Okay, and so when you actually perform spirometry on a patient, you get this kind of triangle shaped graph, which pretty much just indicates how much air they're able to force out over time. So basically the way that you perform spirometry is that you get the patient to put the probe into their mouth and then you tell them to breathe out as hard and as fast as they can until they empty their entire lung capacity into the machine. Um, and you get them to repeat it three times and then you get kind of this graph based on the average of the three times. Um, so for a normal patient without COPD, because there isn't that obstructive nature of um, expiration, you're gonna get pretty much no loss in the force of which you can breathe out air. Um, whereas in COPD, it's, it's kind of like trying to force air out through a straw. And by the end of it, they get quite tired um, and the expiration becomes quite weak towards the end of it. That's why you get that kind of curve. So over time, they're actually being able to force out less and less. Um, yeah, highly recommend if any of you get the chance on your terms to perform spirometries. So based on her spirometry results, looking at this, um, there you go, you've made a diagnosis of COPD. Um, it's defined on spirometry as an FEV1 to FVC ratio of less than 0 0.7. So hers was 0 0.67, which puts her in this gold 2 moderate classification. You also performed a chest x-ray for her um, and you got, <laughs> would you believe, a pretty classic um, example of a COPD, mostly emphysematous patient. So if you're having a look here, it's definitely a hyperinflated chest. So you, 
definitely seeing more ribs than we should. Um, but the real giveaway is the flattened to hemidiaphragms on either sides. You should be seeing a nice curved hemidiaphragm on either side, but we're just not getting that. It's completely flat, um, which is just going to show the increased I suppose, residual volume of the lungs and the gas trapping that you get. Um, you can also see things like a rapid tapering of vascular shadows um, and that long narrow heart shadow as opposed to a much fuller one. Um, and on CT, because we decided to do a CT, which isn't routine for diagnosis, um, it's normally only done when you're looking for an alternative diagnosis or a complication or for lung cancer screening. Um, but this can help to determine, you know, between things like sentry asinar, pan asinar, or paraseptal emphysema. Um, and you can look for changes such as, you know, bulli formations, um, scar tissue, things like that, honeycombing. Okay, this is a pretty useful table just in terms of the basic differences between COPD and asthma, because the two do have a lot of overlap um, and patients can have both. Um, but normally COPD, later age of onset and usually secondary to exposure to risk factors like smoking or environmental pollutants, whereas asthma can occur at any age, um, usually in childhood, usually a strong family history as well, or other kind of atopic things like dermatitis um, and allergic rhinitis. Um, in terms of the symptoms, so you don't normally get that sputum production or cough, chronic cough with asthma. And the dyspnea is normally brought on by um, really predictable triggers. So things like exercise or allergens um, or infections. Uh, both tend to be worse in the mornings though, and asthma is also particularly bad at night. Um, but probably the most important thing is treatment response. So COPD, I mean, it does respond to treatment, but it's a lot less, it's only partially reversible compared to asthma, which tends to respond very, very well um, to bronchodilator therapy. Okay, so in terms of assessing the severity of COPD, um, there's a couple of different tools out there. So the Modified Medical Research Council has put out a dyspnea scale, um, graded zero to four based on, I suppose, the level of shortness of breath and the activities that bring it on. Um, GOLD, which is the Global Initiative for Obstructive Lung Disease, um, which are they're pretty much like the authority on COPD, they rate severity from A to D, graded according to so this scale here, um, the COPD assessment test, which is over on the next slide, um, the number of exacerbations in the last year, and the number of previous hospitalizations for these exacerbations. So this is the CAT assessment um, and patients just, you know, tick off their scores. Um, so obviously you, the GP, are going to get your patient to fill this out. And then based on that, we're going to categorize her in terms of her severity. Now, moving on to management of stable COPD. So she's not coming in with an exacerbation. This is just her new baseline COPD. So there's a couple of different things that we want to do. Number one, at every visit, we want to have a regular review of puffer use and adherence. So nothing is going to get done if the patient's not knowing how to use their puffers or if they're not taking their puffers. Um, and they're also going to review the COPD action plan. So very similar to an asthma action plan, it's basically an action plan on what to do when you have an exacerbation, you know, how to take your puffers, uh, which puffers to take, etc. Then there's non-pharmacological things. So cessation of smoking, most important thing. Um, and obviously there's a bunch of different, you know, motivational interviewing, there's nicotine replacement. Um, I'm sure you guys cover this heaps in your general practice lectures. Um, preventative vaccines. So people with COPD are a lot more prone to pneumococcal infections and the flu. So getting those vaccinations each year 
very important. And then exercise, so you want to optimize lung function as well. In terms of pharmacological management, so you've got your puffers, so your beta-2 agonists, salbutamol, um, salmetrol, and you have your short-acting and long-acting, um, and they pretty much work to relax the smooth muscle cells within your airways and prevent bronchoconstriction. Um, also using asthma. So you've got them, you've got your anti-muscarinics like ipratropium, so very similar to your asthma medications. Um, and they block the acetylcholine effect on the muscarinic receptors in the airways. Um, and then you've got your inhaled glucocorticoids and phosphodiesterase for inhibitors. Um, and they're more effective generally in the chronic bronchitis phenotype and they're only really used in the more severe cases. So gold three and four, remembering that it was a one to four system. Um, and then there's surgery. So when you get into the like really, really severe stuff, there's things like bolectomies, which is pretty much just cutting out essentially useless bits of lung um, where gas is just getting trapped and it's actually preventing the rest of the lung from, you know, doing its function. Um, or lung volume reduction surgery or lung transplants in very, very severe cases. Then there's things like pulmonary rehabilitation, which, you know, everyone um, in the more severe categories is recommended to commence. Um, home oxygen. And home oxygen is a big thing. So it's, you know, people are requiring more than 15 hours a day on oxygen. Um, and it's to keep their SATs above 90%. Um, yeah, and then obviously towards the very dire side of things, palliative care involvement. So this is a really useful slide. It's just like a stepwise approach to how to treat um, the different severities of COPD. It's published, I think this one is COPDX. Um, which is a really good resource online for, it kind of goes through everything, like pathology, um, diagnosis, and management of COPD. Um, but yeah, things like reducing risk factors, optimizing function, optimizing treatment of comorbidities, referring. Yeah, really good slide. And then it goes through the pharmacological interventions. Um, and at what stage you're going to be recommending different approaches. Um, so obviously you're going to start with the SABAs or SAMAs. Um, if that's not effective enough, then you're going to be adding the longer acting bronchodilators. If that's still not working, then you're going to consider adding inhaled corticosteroids, remembering that there are a lot of side effects with that. Um, so, you know, it's your typical steroid use um, side effects, including being more prone to infections, uh, throwing off your blood sugars, osteoporosis, etc., etc. Um, and then remembering that optimizing inhaler technique at every visit is probably the most important thing we can do. And then there's this wonderful slide that kind of shows you all the different puffers that are out there, um, which is really useful. Um, I kind of carried this around with me on my respiratory term and it was so helpful to be able to actually know what patients were on. Um, but yeah, there's a lot out there and in different combinations as well, which just makes things easier for patients, which is going to, you know, increase the chances that they're actually going to adhere and be compliant with their medications which leads to better outcomes. Okay, so this is the ABCD classification that we were talking about um, to kind of stratify severity. And if we're looking at our patient, Mary Smith, she kind of fits into that D category. So pretty severe, which means that we're going to hit her with some regular treatment with a long acting muscarinic antagonist. Um, or if, you know, very severe dyspnea, combining 
a long acting beta agonist with this. Um, and then we can consider combining that with inhaled glucocorticoids. Okay, and based on that, so she's quite severe, um, we'll go back to our large puffer slide and select a couple of things for her. So we're going to want relievers for when she actually has an attack. Um, and we'll probably just go Ventolin for that, as well as a preventer. So because she's quite severe, we'll probably you've decided to pick Simbacort, which is a combination of budesonide, which is an inhaled corticosteroid, to reduce that baseline um, inflammatory response, as well as formaterol. Okay, moving on. You are now an intern at a PN hospital. Congratulations. Um, it's six months later, it's the middle of winter, and Mrs. Smith comes in again. And you notice she's got increasing shortness of breath, so worse than her baseline. Now she's got a wheeze as well, and she's got an increased sputum production over the last two to three days. Um, so normally where it was, it went up to one teaspoon every morning. She's now estimating about a quarter of a cup that she's bringing up every morning. Um, and instead of white, it's turned to a yellowish green color. Um, and she's also complaining of sweats, chills, rigors, and fatigue over the last couple of days as well. Um, so when you're taking a history from her, you want to really compare how she is now to her baseline level of symptoms to see, you know, is this just her new normal or is this an exacerbation of her disease? Um, obviously wanting to have a look at the severity of her symptoms, you know, is she having dyspnea at rest or is it only on activity? Um, asking about the sputum, the amount, whether or not it's purulent, um, whether or not there's blood in it, and any other features that would suggest an alternate diagnosis. So again, asking about constitutional symptoms, chest pain, um, peripheral edema, any risk for PE, um, for pneumothorax, or any kind of viral symptoms that would suggest a viral respiratory infection. So things like arthralgias, um, has she got a sore throat, runny nose, things like that. Or these days asking about COVID risk factors. Um, so then you proceed to examine her and her examination this time is a little bit worse. So her respirate is right up at 28. She's tachycardic, blood pressure is still good. She does have a little bit of a fever at 38 and her stats are 86% on room air. You also notice that she's got some pursed lip breathing, tripoding. Um, she's only speaking in phrases and she's using her accessory muscles. So she is in respiratory distress. Um, you have a listen to her lungs and you can hear some decreased breath sounds bilaterally. Um, there's a global expiratory wheeze and a prolonged expiratory phase. Um, so she's struggling to get air out. Um, you also hear muffled heart sounds, but there's no murmur, regular um, pulse and abdomen is normal and she's got no peripheral edema. Okay, in terms of investigations, so she's come in with severe shortness of breath. You're going to want to do an ECG um, and we'll have a look at that on the next slide. Uh, chest x-ray. So that's mostly to rule out other causes of shortness of breath rather than rule in COPD. Um, but we're going to be wanting to look for consolidation, you know, if there's a pneumonia going on, um, looking for pleural effusion, if it's heart failure, looking for pneumothorax, or is she in acute pulmonary edema? In terms of blood, anyone with shortness of breath is going to get a full blood count, you know, looking for anemia as the cause. Um, EUCs, for any severe you know, renal impairment or electrolyte disturbances, um, a blood glucose, um, as well as TROPS. Um, so anyone coming in with shortness of breath will get TROPS because this is how a heart attack could present. Um, also gonna be wanting to do an ABG for her. Now you don't do an ABG on everyone that comes in with shortness of breath, but given how low her oxygen saturation was, normally if it's less than 90, 
you'd consider doing an ABG, especially if they're in you know, respiratory distress. Um, you could also consider doing a sputum culture. So you don't routinely do this um, in an exacerbation of COPD, but it's at your or the boss's discretion. Uh, and you tend to do it more so if this, this is looking like an infective exacerbation, which in her case it is. Um, so we'll probably send off a sputum culture um, as well as maybe a viral swab. Um, you can look for atypical antigens. Um, so Legionella, streptococcal, urinary antigens, um, viral swabs, influenza, PCR, and COVID swab, especially if she has risk factors. So having a look at her ECG, this is just a typical ECG that you could see in um, severe, like long-term COPD. Um, so you normally see things like right heart strain, right ventricular hypertrophy, P pulmonale, so a peaked P wave, uh, right axis deviation, you might see a right bundle branch block, um, and you can see SC depression or inversion in V1 to 3, so the anterior chest leads. Um, but you tend to see these changes later in the disease course. A lot of the time in COPD, it can just be a normal ECG. So this is your ABG um, with her results and normal values to compare. So her pH is 7.32, so she's acidotic. Um, her CO2 is 55, so that's high. Uh, oxygen is low, very low. Bicarb is 38, so that's high. So there's a little bit of compensation going on. Um, and yeah, SATs are 86% and we've popped her in oxygen, of course. You know, anyone that's coming in, with sets of 86, we're starting them on oxygen. So overall, this picture is showing partially compensated respiratory acidosis. Um, and it is showing that she's a CO2 retainer. So obviously when we're giving oxygen to a CO2 retainer, we're aiming for sets of 88 to 92%. So we get a chest X-ray and this is her chest X-ray. Again, it's showing that hyperinflation um, and flattening of the hemidiaphragms. But now we're also seeing this kind of infective process, opacification in the left lower zone, um, but suggesting, you know, this is an infective exacerbation. So in terms of management of an acute exacerbation of COPD, first thing that... So this I actually stole from Pegasus, which is, if you ever go into FirstNet at the PN Hospital, um, it's kind of, it's one of the um, browser, I suppose, drop down options in FirstNet. And it's just this wealth of resources of how to approach the really common presentations in ED. Um, and there's one for COPD. And this just kind of shows, um, it's, I suppose management depending on the blood gas in an exacerbation of COPD. So for her, she had a low pH, uh, PCO2 was high and she had high bicarb. So that's showing acute on chronic hypercapnic respiratory failure. Um, and then if you look at the table, so PAO2 was in the 50s, uh, PA CO2 was high, and pH was low, so continue same FiO2 and consider non-invasive ventilation or intubation. Yeah, which is more or less what we had discussed earlier. Okay, um, so this I pinched from ETG and it's just about, you know, how many puffs of what to give. Um, so if a patient is tolerating a puffer, um, use puffers, otherwise, use nebulizers to deliver the medication. So you wanna be going with salbutamol as well as ipratropium generally. Um, I'm pretty sure, so this says up to, tell, um, up to 10 puffs of salbutamol and up to six of the ipratropium. Um, I think Pegasus says like 12 and eight, but really you're just titrating according to response. So, I don't know, maybe give 10, 
see how they respond. If they're needing more, you can repeat. Um, so giving the puffers and then also systemic corticosteroids for five days is really important. So if they are tolerating it orally, then it's 30 to 50 milligrams. Um, if they're not tolerating anything orally or it's very severe, then IV hydrocortisone will be your go-to in terms of steroids. Uh, and this is just from AMH, so Australian Medicines Handbook, um, showing, you know, slightly different doses. Um, but yeah, again, it's just titrate according to the needs of the patient. Okay, now in terms of whether or not to give antibiotics, do not routinely give antibiotics in an exacerbation of COPD, but if it's infective, then there's a pretty low threshold for giving antibiotics. Um, and signs that suggest that it's infective is going to be things like increased sputum volume, um, sputum purulence, so changed from yellow, changed from white to yellow or green, um, and whether or not there's a fever. And then ETG recommends the following antibiotics, so amoxicillin or doxy, essentially. A lot of the time you will see augmentin given, um, but ETG, I think, specifically says do not give augmentin unless you grow something that is resistant. Um, and the three most common pathogens um, in COPD are going to be your Haemophilus influenzae, strep pneumoniae, and Moraxella cateralis, um, for which amoxicillin or doxy is generally just fine. So you do all of that. Um, and then when you're looking to discharge a patient, basically they've got to meet a certain number of criteria. So they shouldn't be needing their bronchodilators more than four hourly. They need to be stable and have had no IV therapy for 24 hours. So if they were at the point where they were, they were requiring IV antibiotics or IV steroids, then you are not looking to send them home anytime soon. Um, they need to have been off oxygen for 24 hours unless they're on home oxygen obviously um, they need to be you know mobilizing independently back to baseline eating drinking and sleeping fine um, they should either be able to give themselves their medications or have someone at home that helps them with their medications and they need to have follow-up arrangements um, organized for them to go home with and yeah, that's just, obviously there's a lot more, um, you know, if they've been admitted from a respiratory physician point of view, but this is just your basic, basic management um, as you, the intern in ED. And yeah, that's all I have for now. Um, hope you learned something. If you've got any questions, feel free to shoot me an email. And yeah, good luck with the rest of the year, guys.